In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO SDSU Extension for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of four local events were held in South Dakota in Sioux Falls, Watertown, Belfouche, and Mitchell. Okay, how this is going to kind of work, we're going to have our producer panel now. Basically, each producer will come up, um, and we have three, Charlie Edinger, Craig Staley, and, and <coughs> Matt Bainbridge will be our three uh, farm producers, basically. And we're going to have them each give a short little presentation, and then they're going to basically sit on the panel, and you guys can ask them questions, and they'll try to answer them as the best they can. So we really appreciate this. I think this is such a valuable part of any... Uh, meeting we get some real life producers up here and tell us what they're doing on their operation. So I did have some real short bios, but I think I've changed my mind and let you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves and your operations because nobody knows it better than yourselves. So, Greg? Hi, I'm Craig Staley. I farm right in the Mitchell area with my brother Gene. Uh, Mitchell's kind of a unique area because it's not really southeast or not really south central. You don't East of Mitchell, you see a lot more diverse crop rotations. You got more winter wheat. Um, you get farther east, the farther west. I mean, west of Mitchell, you get more grain sorts and sunflowers. And guys are just doing a lot better job rotating more north out there. You get very far east of Mitchell, and and the, there's not as much no till. And I think their definition of a three-way rotation is like corn, soybeans, Miami. So <laughs> so kind of right on that end. And it just, you know, for the years in, in our areas, you get, you see some winter wheat and then corn. Corn goes to seven bucks, and pretty much everybody's like, I think I'm just going to raise corn. And they kind of, kind of bail out on the wheat a little bit. But I think now we're back, you know, I mean, the benefits of wheat rotation are so huge and with commodity prices. Um, I think you'll see people delve, delve back into more wheat. You know, I know the things are getting corn pretty high. When my brother, he's he's always thinking about the financial end, and he last couple of years he's always asking me about the wheat, how it looks. And I finally just asked him. I said, "What? You're not usually that interested in the wheat. Why are you so interested?" He said, "Well, I was hoping it dies so I could put corn in." So, <laughs> but anyways. Uh, First started no tilling back in uh, 1986, and just uh, basically was planting corn. And back then, we were still raising barley, and uh, just started with planting the corn. It's 38 inch roll corn planted into barley, and that worked pretty good. And as me being the guy that used to have to do all the cultivating <coughs> of the corn, I really liked it because anything to get out of cultivating corn is good as far as I'm concerned. And that, then I think it was the summer of 89. I mean, there was really nobody no till any soybeans yet. I went up, <clears throat> I'll never forget it because I think it was a dry, some of a dry year. Went up to the Redfield station where Dwayne, Dwayne was there for three, four years and he was, had a, had a field day up there. And he'd drive, drive up there and there weren't really any soybeans, it was just small grain and corn and you know it's hot, everything's burning up in the field and pull into the Redfield station and it just looks like this oasis in the middle of the desert. And you know, so we all get on and he's got these no till beans and corn planted the weed stubble and it just looks phenomenal. And there's like I don't know if there's fifty 50 people at least maybe there was a hundred. There's a hundred say there's a hundred people driving around the on these trailers, but 99 of them are these huge skeptics. They're just trying to prove, trying to figure out why this looks so good. So he just had to, I'll never forget that, go through and try to answer all their questions in his blunt way and tell them that, hey, this is how it is. And, you know, they, you know, they respect that. So kind of got started after that, went home and ordered a new John Deere 750 drill and started no-till and the beans, corn, and wheat. Um, and then everything went pretty good until uh, like the wet year of 93, if everybody remembered, and started having trouble after you no-till for a while, you get residue builds up and it gets, you know, in a wet spring, it gets a little bit harder to, especially trying to plant into winter wheat, plant your corn, you start having trouble 
getting it planted in the spring. So it started about, I, I talked to Jason, about 1996, he was trying to figure out what can we do, mainly on the, behind the weed, how to get that corn planted into the weed. We started uh, looking at us trying to plant some cover crops in the, in the winter, in a winter wheat stubble. It took a while to find anything that worked because you just have to try try to come up with stuff. Um, some of the advantages for obviously for planting cover crop in the wheat stubble, I'm going to talk mainly about wheat stubble, is um, fixed nitrogen for the next crop, which is kind of marginal. I mean, you can put the different legumes in and you probably get a, it's hard to get very much nodulation in that short period of time. Some years you might get some, but I don't really think you can pick, can plan on fixing a whole lot in like you can in the fuller season. Uh, one of the main things behind wheat stubble obviously was trying to manage your soil moisture in our area. You know, we have a tendency to start out, you know, can get some pretty heavy rainfalls in the spring of the year. Usually end up drying up by August, but you still have to get the crop in. And uh, be able to provide for a living root system. Um, if you have a have all that root mass in the spring, you can, it's a lot easier for trapability to plant across it than if you just have have the weeds stubble uh, left standing. Uh, the other thing is change the residue color. Go from a light colored residue to a dark re colored residue to help warm the soils up. So that was something, and also help, which is very important in our area, build organic matter. We're, you know, where we're sitting in South Dakota, I mean, we just don't have, can't be giving up organic matter. You're talking somewhere around 3%, you know, we just don't have enough to lose be destroying organic matter through tillage. I mean, everybody, you go to all these tillage, I went to this uh, field day here this last year, and I went, they were showing some tractors, and uh, we looked at the tractors, and they also had a field demonstration on this new greatest tillage implement, and the guy was talking and telling all the wonderful things he could do, and finally one farmer said, he said, I. I kind of like what this does, but would you tell me how I can use this and still build my organic matter? And that was pretty much the end of it, because you can't. <laughs> so, I mean, just that point alone tells you, you know, where we're sitting, we just have to try to save or build on organic matter. And, I mean, it's so obvious if you look at, uh, like, yield maps, I mean, most of this ground's been farmed maybe 60, 70 years, and everybody, <coughs> 40 years ago, there was all these 40 acre fields scattered. Now everybody's taking the fences out. These little 10 acre patches of grass, you know, 20 years ago you took them out and now you're farming across them. But even now you go back and look at a yield map, even if you did a proper, you know, fertilize the whole field right, you can still see, still see those yield bumps from that old that pasture because it's got higher organic matter. Haven't mined it like you did the other stuff. so. I mean, it's just, just looking at stuff, well, that's one great thing about yield maps. You look at some of that stuff and you go, hey, I got to do something to try to save my organic matter. And, and no-till with cover crops is you know, going to help very much. Some of the things that you're not going to harvest a crop that you need to look at with cover crops to try to keep your low seed costs low since you're not going to harvest anything. Uh, with our short growing season, it has to be easy to establish, easy to plant, be able to use the equipment you have. Uh, one of the most important things that you find out trying it for a long period of time is you have to have aggressive growth. We just don't have long enough season if you're putting it in behind a wheat or, or especially corn or soybeans. You have to have something that's going to grow aggressive in the fall in order to get, get enough biomass to do any good. Uh, and you have to have something that pure do a diversifier rotation, you gotta have something that helps your rotation, not hurts it. Obviously, if you're putting corn in, you probably wanna have, you know, lean to have more broad leaves and legumes in the cover crop to put the corn back in it. And that's part of what goes on being not detrimental to the next crop. <coughs> and you also have to watch the herbicides. I mean, it's something you don't think about, but like if you're, you got weed in this year, you want to put a cover crop in, you want to make sure you use something with either no residual or low residual that won't hurt those cover crops. And I mean, it's just, you know, it's one of those things you don't think about a lot. I remember one time, 
when, when I was trying to find some uh, different cover crops, I had weed stubble and uh, I was going to spray it and I had a bunch of buckwheat. So I thought, you know, I really wasn't, at that time, you didn't, I just wasn't thinking about the cover crop that much. So I put like an ounce toward on it. And so I sprayed it, killed the buckwheat, and then I started thinking, you know, why? Maybe I'm going to put a crop, you know, it wasn't a very good plan. I said, I'm going to put a cover crop in there. And I go, I know Florida's really bad. I got all that residue. It hasn't really rained. I'm thinking, God, it's got to be mostly caught up in that residue. So I tried some sunflowers in there. And planted the sunflowers. It really didn't maybe rain 20, 30 hundreds. Probably had one come up out of a thousand. So I mean, that uh, word I was definitely good at. You want to keep sunflowers from growing, even an ounce of it. So I mean, if that would have been my crop, it would have been bad. But since it was just a cover crop, but it makes you think about things like that. Um, some of the different ways. Uh, a lot of mine, I, you know, behind the weed stubble, I like to use a, an 1850 drill. Uh, just because you can, you know, the mixes just work a lot better um, than trying to plant single, single, uh, or even two, two crop cover crops. Uh, I have planted some with the vacuum planter. The one thing about planting with the planter, just like planting soybeans, you can get by with a little less seed and put it in rows. And some of the things that I've tried is the grain sorghum disc. Uh, Mile is about the same size as hairy vetch, so you can actually plant the I planted some vetch with my planter. And then also, one year I was able to plant the vetch and field peas in a mixture with soybean plates. So there are some things you can use planter for. And, and the other thing is to broadcast. I've tried uh, aerial broadcasting uh, a couple times, and it pretty much is, well, the first time I tried, uh, just cereal rye, and I think I put it on a little too early. It was probably in middle of August. <coughs> I hadn't let the, the corn had dried up. And uh, where I had, you know, the only place that I really got a really good stand of rye is where the corn was a little thin and some low spots. So I think if I would have waited a little bit until like mid September to, uh, to uh, spread that. And then this year I did some more, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And anyway, like I say, when I first started with uh, Chase, and we started with the clovers, because we thought that was, you know, I mean, that was a good legume. And we thought we'd put that in behind the wheat and get some growth of the corn in. What we found out, I was just talking to Chase, and maybe we had the wrong variety. It just grew too, way too slow. And just by fall, there was hardly any growth. In the spring, it didn't take off. And you really would have had to wait, wait until you know, into June and really have do be enough good to, to help uh, with enough biomass. And then the hairy batch, I, th this is a little more, grows a little bit faster, but I planted this with the planter, but I, it worked pretty good because I had some preventing ground and I just was able to go out and plant rows of it, but I planted that probably towards the end of July so I had enough time for it to get enough growth, but if you try putting it in behind weed, it just doesn't seem to have quite enough aggressive growth in the fall to do as much good as some of the other crops. And the one that really has worked, I mean it took, I started like I said in like 96 and then tried all this stuff and none of it worked real good and then I think uh, around 2007 everybody, everybody started trying this radish canola lentil mix and that's been worked really good for anybody that tried it mainly because you get so much growth in the fall with the with the radishes and the, the canola. Uh, and it grows late in the fall, so I mean, it'll still be alive Thanksgiving. You know, so get good fall growth. The seed cost is pretty affordable. And, you know, if you could put a, put a legume in there, hopefully you can get some kind of, a little bit of nitrogen fix, but it's kind of iffy. And I'm sure everybody's seen the oil seed radishes, the kind of growth and the tuber on them is phenomenal. And you get, you know, I mean, a good, good crop canopy, it helps break down that weed stubble so you can, you know, get it planted good in the spring. And it just really is amazing what that, what that ground's like after you have a good stand like that in the spring. It just plants so much better. 
and you know later in the season you start all that starts breaking down and you get some night nutrient release into your corn and the corn will just you know looks better you can just tell by the health of it compared to some that's not finding the cover crop and then i i was saying about the chickling vetch and field peas i planted those um with my planter after weed stubble and it they did okay but it just still wasn't near as aggressive growth in the fall compared to the radish. But the one thing about it, uh, you know, put it in a row is you're able to save some on seed costs. Anyway, I just, um, I have a list of different cover crops you can try, but I mean, really for the ones that really work good, either have the radish, radish, some kind of radish canola blend, no matter what kind of legume, if you want to put lentils or if you're going to graze it, you can put some mill it with it, cow peas, and just a whole lot of options, but um, the, ra the main thing is just the radish and canolas, or the turnips if you're going to graze. The other good thing about the turnips, I was going to say, that if uh, when it gets down, down to like zero, they freeze like little rocks, so it really slows the coyote and deer hunters from running across your field at 60 miles an hour. <laughs> you know, it's pretty slow, but... Uh, But the other one, and then just this last September, or, or last spring, um, I started talking to Jake, wanted to try something, something else. I mean, everybody knows what works into the, the canola radishes work in the weed stuff, but what can we do different in the, in the behind our corn? And it's so hard, you know, by the time you get done combining your corn, it's getting so late trying to get out there to drill something. And so working with uh, Jason and Heidi here at the NRCS, we decided to try aerial applying some uh, winter wheat, ryegrass, and uh, oilseed radish. I think Charlie and Matt, they both tried some too. So some different people in the area. Anyway, we uh, aerial applied that in the corn. I think it was September 15th. And you know we had good rainfall this spring, so it really took off good. And I think this picture is from what, January 16th, so there was some growth, and it'll be in, really interesting in the spring to see what Ashley's under. You know, if you dig it up and see how much root mass is gone, because I'm hoping there'll be a lot of root mass under the ground too. And I know the winter wheat will, you know, overwinter, and we'll have some more growth on that in the spring. So pretty excited about that. I don't know if it's a real dry fall, obviously you're going to probably have time to get it, get it established, but this year with the rainfall it really took off good. And then I have also tried, like I said, I tried the cereal rye, and uh, I mean if you're not, I know guys that plant winter wheat don't like that rye very much because they're worried about getting contamination, but um, I planted it with my drill even in December. I mean, you usually can get some pretty good spring growth on that, and, you know, usually and uh, better than winter wheat, but that all depends on what you want to do for, you know, how much wheat you got in your rotation. But anyway, some of the things I just, you know, I mean, I think the main thing is just make sure you plant mixtures with, you. make sure you have a couple of aggressive things like the uh, radish and turnip in there. Uh, Make sure you use high enough seeding rates. Try to get it planted right after the wheat. And uh, I mean, the one thing that you have to watch, um, you got so much residue out there to get the drill to plant right. I usually don't start planting. You know, I don't. I like to dry out. A lot of times, don't just like trying to combine wheat. You got to wait till till later on in the day and have some hot, dry weather so you can make sure you don't get too much air pinning. And with the canola. And, uh, the canola and the rapeseed, they use so much sulfur that you want to make sure next the next spring you put some sulfur on through, you know, use AMS in your nitrogen mix so you get plenty of sulfur out there so you're not deficient because you can have a lot of trouble with sulfur deficiency behind those cover crops if you don't. And if I get enough uh, growth on the cover crop where it, uh, usually have some volunteer weed in there. I usually, I'll try to spray it. You know, a lot of times you get up to 50 and degrees in the middle of November. I'll just go and spray it right then instead of waiting until spring if I think I have enough growth. And the main thing is just keep trying different mixtures. You know, 
we've only been now you know the cover crop thing is not very very old yet so we just got to keep i just would encourage people to keep trying different mixtures thank you Again, my name is Charlie Edinger. I'm on my farm with my brother and Aurora Davis in the Champlain counties. Um, all right, can you hear me better? No. Uh, That's good. Speak up. I have a hard time speaking up. My brother is the doctor in the family. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I farm with my brother Chet. Um, again, I live in Mitchell. Um, been back here farming for 17 years now, and we raise wheat, corn, soybeans, and sunflowers. And in the past, we raised mallow, and peas, and melons. All right, I guess the main reason why we plant cover crops is we need to uh, use up the excess water. Um, basically, from July until the following May, you know, we have all that time to accumulate water. Uh, that's our biggest challenge is being able to get the corn crop planted in a correct and timely manner. Um, in the summer, I get to fly around once in a while with my little ultralight, and this is actually a picture of a field that we got all the northwest of Plankton. And there's just you can see all the ground bound spots out there. Um, this was basically a stacked wheat rotation that we did get in before, but um, we do have some drainage issues out there. There's a lot of clays in the soil. And, um, we want to try to do as much as we can to help you know, get rid of all that excess water. All right, um, basically healthy soils contain, contain <coughs> aquifers, or in this case, I can call them mini tile lines. They are created from earthworms, roots, and organisms, and basically they do this work for free. It doesn't cost a thousand bucks an acre to install a pot, these tile lines. Um, so basically, the more roots you have in the soil, the healthier it's going to be. Um, we also like to break down residue. Um, in this picture, we have an excessive amount of residue. After a wheat harvest last year, we did not plant any cover crops into this. And um, you can see, it, there, it looks like there's almost just as much wheat stubble out there yet as there is corn stalks. And you know, we're looking at Oh, 2012 sweet crop of probably 70 or 80 bushel of corn stalks this year. The corn this year was probably you know, 150 or inch. Um, Dwayne claims you can break down the residue a little bit too fast. I guess in our case in this area, we've had a hard time doing that. Um, so you know, we kind of felt a little bit fortunate that we actually got the crop, the crop planted you know, well in, in, in a timely fashion this past spring. <coughs> All right, and then on this slide, basically nutrient cycling is another reason that we like to plant cover crops. We want to move that extra nitrogen back to the surface into organic matter where it's not prone to leaching. If you look at this soil test, basically this is um, a soil test taken from the same field, two different tests, of where we had wheat stubble, and on the left hand side is where we kept the wheat stubble clean after August. The one on the right is where we let the volunteer wheat grow and get soddy. So you can notice that basically it sucked up about 36 pounds of additional nitrogen and took that back up to the top to the surface where you know, it's not prone to leaching. I know Rainer Moore fairly well and I had a few questions for him you know, at certain times and then I had to cast him about how fast does nitrates, how fast do nitrates leach in the soil? And he claims that for this area, uh, nitrates will leach down about three inches for each additional inch of rain that falls on the ground. So it's pretty important if you want to keep your nitrates, you know, higher up in the soil profile as possible. And then comparing these two tools soil test to all the other soil tests that I had taken in wheat stubble and had planted a cover crop to. The highest amount of nitrates that I found in the two foot sample on any of those soil tests was 20 pounds. So I felt that we had a lot more 
residual and remaining after the wheat harvest, even though it turned out to be a better wheat crop than we had anticipated. Um, basically, I think the, the cover crops and maybe a little sprinkling of volunteer weeds did a much better job of capturing that nitrogen and taking it back to the surface. So we had some soil test levels down to eight and nine pounds per acre in the top two feet. So just not sure if we can expect half of that to be returned with next year's crop or more, but um, at least we know it's up to the top where we won't lose it. <coughs> Another reason to raise uh, cover crops is to help reduce compaction. And I guess my biggest pet peeve on the farm is soil compaction. And I guess we'll make an effort to lessen the effects of heavy equipment by using tracks as much as possible. And then we also make an effort to restore the effects of this compaction on light equipment with cover crops. And the tillage radish is kind of, is kind of my favorite so, cover crop of choice. Also, we want to keep the uh, organisms active as long as possible. <coughs> Basically, this is a picture of me soil testing just a month ago, and it was pretty amazing how I you know, taken these frozen cores of soil in a <coughs> bucket, and here after about 15 seconds of warm air, that earthworm is squirming around and active. And it's one important thing as you want enough roots out there to keep all the microorganisms active and we've got tremendous earthworm levels in our crops because we've been built on for so long that it's in fact in the spring when I'm chasing planters and making sure the planting is done correctly I kind of feel guilty because I'm feeling so many earthworms digging up you know looking at the seeds making sure they're you know, properly planted that it's, it's a good thing to see but I, again I feel really guilty of tearing them up so much. I guess we've tried various um, ways of planting cover crops. What we currently do, what we've done the last couple of years, is is use um, it's basically our hybrid planter. It's an air planter, so it's a it's a bower bar. And it's got Kinsey row units on it. It's a 36 row 20 inch roll. And one thing I like about it is it does a better job than an air screen of getting the seeds placed properly. And we're able to use our air residue managers some of the residue out of the way. Also, we drilled with an air seeder. And then, quote point number three, um, about six or eight years ago, we had uh, some neighboring farmers that built a broadcast seeder that was able to follow the trend lines in the winter wheat fields after, um, or during the, wheat, the growth of the wheat crop. So we actually hired them to spread some cover crops into our growing wheat crop about the third week of June. And it didn't work that well. Um, I think it was just a little bit early, and if we would have had more rain afterwards, um, it might have helped also. But the seeds got down there in the canopy, and whatever did sprout dried out after you know, a few weeks. And, um, so basically, the only luck we had was basically the tire tracks. But uh, the cover crop had a chance to get some moisture and some sunlight. Also, we've used a, an airflow machine. Just broadcast it with a fertilizer and use some uh, standing wood stubble, and then follow that with uh, some vertical tillage to try to get to incorporate. And didn't have very much luck with that because for the most part we tried it. I mean, August was a pretty dry month, so nothing really got established very well. And then the latest method we tried was a small open air plane. I guess the cover crops that we have seeded are listed here. Um, I feel like my favorite is the radish. You know, it's it's a very robust plant with the root. It's, you know, it does a good job with sucking up nutrients and uh, water and helping with soil compaction issues. Turnips we usually throw in the mix. I've never really had a high affinity for turnips, um, but they do do a good job. Um, to me, it seems like you've got much of that root mass above ground, but I know they do a very good job of penetrating really well in drier conditions. And then the next bunch, you know, rapeseed, dinner, and rape, you know, the cabbage, they're all brassicas. And um, they're very good, you know, choices for good growth. You can use that those in residue composition. 
Lentils are another crop that or cover crop we've tried in the mix, haven't done so in the last couple of years. But um, they're not as robust and aggressive crops, so if you plant them, try to keep them segregated a little bit so not competing against any radish and the out there. You know, if you have an air seeder, you can basically put them in the front or the back rank and then the rest of them in the opposite rank, you know, get them a little more opportunity to uh, get your growth. Oops. Also, winter wheat, um, that was done this past fall with an airplane. We did not intentionally plant the winter wheat. Um, other than the volunteer, it usually comes out there. We always make sure that we uh, do a burn down and before or within two days after planting on the crop if the conditions are good. Because as I learned this, this past August, Crop crops will emerge in three days if the conditions are good. Um, one thing I'm thinking about doing for maybe next fall is maybe using that cover crop planter, that planter, following corn harvest, maybe trying to throw down some fertilizer and maybe you know 30 pounds of, of uh, winter wheat in 20 inch rows to help deal with next spring's issues if things turn wet. So then basically, if I were to do a burn down and throw residual down, I would knock it out in the spring. And then, actually, the first cover crop that we ever tried was soybeans, and that's the reason why we tried soybeans was I've always had a desire to raise a double crop after wheat, and this was back probably 10 years ago, and we got them planted, and they probably 10 to 20 percent got up, but uh, they never wanted anything. Um, in fact, back in 2012, with the with the early wheat harvest, we actually had planned on trying to plant some, but with the forecast looking as bad as it was, we opted not to. But hopefully someday before I die, we can do a double crop. All right, then this last year's experiences. Um, this is a picture actually got from Jason Miller. It's a tree that makes the radishes turn into rape seed. And uh, the rape seed actually was kind of a mistake in the mix, and um, so we got kind of got the mix at a discounted rate because this stuff bolted in a hurry and flowers and set seed. And I'm just hoping it's not going to be an issue come next spring. I mean, heard it shouldn't be that bad. Um, so we basically planted that mix out, and then we had a local source of two straight radishes um, that we got, and then uh, finished up the couple of crop planting goals. And then uh, this is kind of a similar picture like Craig had. I'm glad to see that I'm not the only one that's got corn on the ground out there also. <laughs> but um, this uh, worked pretty well. It was a good fall for cover crops. You know, we had shots of moisture to get things going. The only thing I kind of regret not doing was, was targeting the fields with less surface residue out there because there was you know, a pretty good shot of Heat stubble. In fact, this is the same field that you saw earlier. So it was a stacked wheat on wheat rotation into corn stalks. So you, know, you have that much fewer cover crop seeds hit the soil. You know, if they're on the soil, I understand. But like Craig had mentioned, it's going to be interesting, interesting to see what happens this next spring to see if we have any new or continuing to look at it. And then this is uh, basically the uh, same field picture from Jason Miller that they took on uh, end of October. And that's uh, basically what the mix was. In the week 15, 45 pounds, and ryegrass to the level of radish and two and a half. Other things to consider um, on our farm, the last couple of years, just to be able to try to grow a reasonable, cover, a reasonable cover crop, I've eliminated any herbicides that had any type of uh, um, residual. So I don't want to take any chances and uh, you know, put a cover crop at risk or not. <coughs> and then basically fertility, we've 
been a little bit lax in the fertility end of it. Um, this year it turned out well because we had an unexpected amount of residual nitrogen in the soils. Um, but if you want to grow a good cover crop, you got to be able to be able to eat it. So a lot of times it's nice to have, you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds of nitrogen out there to feed the crop. Also, if you raise much for brassicas, like Craig said, you want to make sure you have them so for the choose corn crop. And then rotational wise, you know, it just all depends on what you want to accomplish. Um, the, it's easy, easy choice, easy selection around here to, to follow the least double. You know, there's been a lot of talk of other rotation and, and timing issues with crops, but it just kind of comes down to what you want to accomplish. And then again, burn down to like I mentioned before, make sure you get it done right before or immediately after the plant cover crop. Otherwise, you could have some issues. Well, I'm Matt Bainbridge. I uh, farm just south of here by Ethan with my dad Lewis and brother Neil. I am the least prepared speaker up here, I guess. <laughs> I don't really have a slideshow, but but I thought that um, Craig and, and Charlie did a pretty good job of, of explaining things. We do a lot of similar things yeah, that, that they do too. Uh, mostly what we're using cover crops for is after winter wheat. <laughs> We'll go in there with uh, turnips and radishes and veg. We had uh, some oats in there this year too. And, and we usually uh, look for grazing for our cattle. And uh, we, had, we had really good luck this year. We didn't try any last year just because it was so dry that, that we didn't even think it was worth it. And, and I guess rightfully so, you know, nothing really would have come up last year anyways. Um, <clears throat> I don't even know, we have pictures here, but. This is just some uh, residue that we we're planting into this spring. Uh, you can kind of see we just use a, a regular, we use a drop row cleaner on our planter. And we just try to, we don't get real aggressive with our row cleaners. We just try to, try to pretty much sweep it clean off the soil. We don't want to move a lot of soil or, or sometimes I've even kind of erred on taking too little residue off and just trying to, trying to not make it super black so that we don't have the, the issues with crust and like like a lot of the conventional guys do um just another view of our planter you can see our homemade uh tank on front there we run a starter fertilizer with our corn and uh just have a john deere corn planter and uh and a uh, john deere 1990 ccs drill that, that we plant soybeans and wheat and a couple crops <coughs> much for different pictures here. Um, I guess that Craig and Charlie pretty much covered the reasons that we're trying to do all this stuff. You know, we're trying to build a healthier, more resilient soil so that it'll stand up to some of these things like drought and into uh, hot spells in the summertime and just trying to get, get more consistency where we don't have to, to worry so much about a heavy rain washing out our soil or worry about the soils bake in after we plant and not get a stand. You know, I think, um, <clears throat> well, I've been back on the farm now for about 15 years, or I guess I've, I've had some farmland of my own for about 15 years now. And we, we've we never replanted a whole field before. We'll go in there, we'll have drown out spots and, and we'll replant those spots, but we've never had the, the trouble with the heavy rain crusting over our soil and not getting a stand. So I think that's that's really one benefit that you can kind of point to, to no till for. Um, some of the new things that we're trying, we just bought a fertilizer spreader that we can variable rate with. So we're trying to um, to really manage different parts of the field, and we all have those spots that are too wet to plant in the spring that are always just a pain, you know, and I see a lot of guys now are running vertical tillage or they'll go out and they'll, they'll till those spots. Well, our idea, and we haven't even done this yet, we're hoping to start this summer, we're gonna put a micro bin on the back of our fertilizer spreader, and we're gonna try and blow cover crop seed on to those spots. 
So if you have an alkali spot, you try to put something out there that'll that'll tolerate the salt, you know, something like a rye or something like that. Just something to start using that water out of the profile so that you can start raising a better crop there. And um, well, we haven't haven't done it yet. We've we've tried a few things just with our no-till drill. We, we'll go in this fall after after uh, corn harvest. I took some uh, rye seed in and we just just try to plant some of these alkali spots and some of the draws and everything where it's always wet. I really wasn't expecting it to, uh, to get cold right after harvest and stay cold until right now, I guess. So we didn't, it didn't come up at all in the uh, fall or in the winter here. So we're hoping that some of it will come up in the spring. And, and those are always the spots that we have a hard time planting into too. Those are you know, the spots without the residue that always seems to want to ball up the planter and let it all up. So we're hoping if we can kind of get a mat of something growing out there and I'll kind of decide in the spring, you know, when I'm spraying, if I want to kill it, kill it off right away or if I want to let it grow a little bit and then come back, you know, right before it comes up and then I'll spray it off. So I guess those are some of the new things that we're going to try and, and um, it, you know, we have we have a lot of presentations up here and a lot of really intelligent people, but this this really isn't an exact science yet. I mean, there's going to be some failures. We we failed quite a few times, you know, and there's just slight tweaks, and everybody's operation is a little bit different. But if you try something, I think we are headed in the right direction. So whether we get there next year, probably not. But I think that we are headed in the right direction. So if we just keep trying and tweaking things and, and paying attention to what's going on in our fields, I think we can we can really uh, benefit a lot of things. Well, man, I think you uh, hit the nail on the head there. I think the the fear of failure sometimes keeps us from trying things that we maybe know in our heart are the right things to do, but we just don't want to fail, have people laugh at us. So. We uh, thank you guys for trying some of these things and for being willing to come up here today and share them with us. I think what we'll do now, we'll open it up for questions. Um, I will try to walk around with a mic and, and you guys get to talk into a mic so you can become famous for a short period of time here. But uh, we'll go around, get some questions from these guys. Maybe say who you would like to address the questions to, whether it's one or all of the group. And so we've got Matt, Charlie, and Craig here. So anybody got a question? Everybody's shy, I don't Okay, you don't have to use the mic. You just ask a question. <laughs> Charlie, me and you farm over to work on your life. Have you ever messed with Jerry? Is this the one? Okay. The question was Have you ever tried sugar beets for any of your swaps? No, we have not. Um, the only people I know are the Macklins. They actually are now farming a piece of crap ground that we used to own. <laughs> and are making improvements to it. Um, and I was pretty amazed at it. And this was probably five, six years ago, or maybe longer, when they raised those sugar bait beets. And um, tremendous cover crop out there. I was, in fact, I'd go out there and check them out myself because I was so impressed. Piece of junk around that they were doing that well. But there's still, yeah, they help, but I don't know those alkali spots. You, you know, if you listen to the way, you'll, you'll know that you'll stress being able to intensively crop that soil so that those salts don't move like they do. Um, but no, I have not had a sugar beet summer for yet. Okay. I know you guys are thinking of things just. Come on. This is your chance. We got some good guys up here. Right. How do you terminate your canola with Roundup Ready? Question was how do you terminate your canola with Roundup Ready canola? Yeah, um, I, like I said, I like to kill it in the fall. You know, usually spray it out in the fall, so because I don't want it to go. Because if you let it go in the spring, it can take off pretty quick on you. So like, uh, you know, at, at pound atrazine, you know, 
with Roundup. Usually you don't have much regrowth, but I've had canola even when I killed it, you know, um, if you have like a low spot or something, there will be enough seed that you'll get some canola in the field that will go to seed. But, you know, because I've seen it, but usually over three, it just keeps getting less and less, and a couple of years it's gone again. So yeah, that is a concern because it's Roundup ready. And if it goes to seed, you got more Roundup ready than more seed. But what I've seen is, you know, with the rotation, it just, especially with, you know, wheat in there, you're not going to have any of it go. So it didn't, it didn't prolificate. It just kept going. After two, three years, it was gone again. So it is a concern. But I didn't, I haven't seen it multiply. It just kind of go, after two, three years, it's gone. One year we had issues, um, and it was, must have been five, six years ago when we had meat and cabbage in the mix, and uh, the canola had overwintered. Next April, it was excessively wet. You know, it started growing, growing and growing, and it got to be about, you know, three foot tall by the time we were able to get out there. By that time, it was almost May, and it was a real pain. I you know, basically had to, with a strout, a stout shot of my mix mix plus additional uh, matrazine you know, to knock it out. Luckily, it didn't take it out. But, uh, so it was, yeah, I was pretty worried about it. Should have actually hired a plane to fly it on because it's so wet earlier on. But I, I waited because I wanted to spray it on the ground where I should have just hired a plane to take it out earlier. Uh, we actually had trouble one year with the uh, low found out to be hardened seed. So it <clears throat> started growing right away in the spring. And it was a, um, I don't even remember what it was for sure. It was a, uh, I think it was canola. And the leaf is pretty uh, waxy, so it's pretty hard to get, get around it. So I didn't know if it was around it pretty or not. But we use a 2,4-D and clarity mixture with my burden down in the corn anyway. So, so we were able to, to fry it off. And as long as you have the mic, I have a question for you. I know you guys have some livestock. How do you integrate the cover crops into your livestock operation? Do you think that's advantageous to kind of have both those working in synergy? Yeah, I think it works pretty good for us. Um, <clears throat> we actually would still be grazing cover crops right now, but but the uh, cattle worked them over so good, we thought we'd better, better get them off of there because it was getting quite a ways down there. But, but really with the, the cattle, they're just kind of cycling the nutrients one more time too, you know, just taking the plant matter and, and letting it come right out the back end, I guess. But, uh, but um, yeah, it's worked really good for us and, and the cattle just love it. it. It doesn't look like there's that much out there for them to eat, but they'll just stay content out there and don't drink much water and really don't eat much mineral and, and uh, really don't need a whole lot of hay to, uh, to make it through the winter on that. Okay, any more questions out there? Yes, sir. We like cover crop we use the 750-year-old from the stubble. And I'm getting it down there in soil contact. It just seems like we have so much trash. There's no cover. We have a line of spot where there ain't quite as much trash. They have a pretty good stand. I've seen that for a couple of years. You know, it's just so much trash that cover crop. I can't seem to get started before we have all that, that mass and straw in it. Question was how you deal with all the matter vegetation getting cover crop started. I guess. Um, I guess one idea is just to cut your wheat the size you can and just blow uh, less of the straw into the ground. And um, I guess Craig kind of touched on it earlier. If you kind of wait until the afternoon when it's nice and warm out there, then hopefully you can kind of cut through that and get a pretty good stand. I guess we've had pretty good luck so far with, with our girl. That's kind of one reason why I like the visit that we have, even though it's 20 inch wide rows, which is in my opinion a little bit too wide. Sevens or 15s would be better. Um, we do have residue managers out there in front of it, which definitely helps. Um, one, one concept Dwayne Beck has tried this past year is um, basically setting your depth a little bit deeper and then raising up your closing arm so that you don't have that issue of bearing your seeds. So maybe if you 
possibly might try to if you get cut through it with a deeper setting, you know, it might work out all right. Yeah, a lot of times what's happening there is here you're here pinning that that straw down in there. If you've got a stripper head help and then like Charlie said, we go deeper and then actually tie the closing wheels up on the on your drill. And so you're actually planting down in that trench and leaving it open. Because especially with a small seeds, bigger seeds, you don't need to do that with small seeds. <coughs> on on the canola thing, uh, Mike Mechnick did a study on that at, at Pier one time and the sulfonylureas are really tough on so any of the Harmony Express type things out there just whack the heck out of the hole. And Vanjil's not, or Clarity or Vanjil isn't all that good because the Canadians used Vanjil on canola in the old days before they had Randall Freddy, they used to do it off label. <laughs> they didn't use it as weed control in canola. Okay, thanks, Any more questions? You guys having some success with, or, or um, do you see the advantage in putting a cover crop in even that late with uh, with corn? You're seeing some advantage of, of doing that. It just seems like to me you're not going to see anything of, of any value. Are you talking? You're talking about in the corn stalks, going to beans. Either, either in or post post harvest. Yeah, well, I, like I said, I, even when I drilled, Matt was talking about drilling that rye and the cereal rye, and even if it doesn't get much growth in the fall, it's so aggressive that by springtime, it's so much more aggressive than weed, it'll get, you know, the, the times I've tried it, I mean, you can get, you know, I planted the soybeans, and I didn't, I wanted to see what kind of effect it had, so I let it, so I let it get to, right, like, foots, I had like 30 foot strips of rye and then no, you know, just strip through the field so I could try it. So I let it go until it was in the food stage and that was just uh, towards the end of, by the end of May and just sprayed out and ground up and it was dry that year and that's still, if anything, yield, I combined the strips and uh, the, where the rye, well, I had the rye, it still yielded like a bushel better than beans even though it was that dry. So you'll get good growth with rye in the spring, even if it doesn't come up very good. It's just a matter of if you've got time to get planted. And we'll see on this other mix what happens. I guess we're going to find out. This is the first year of us trying it. Um, so I can't really give you an honest answer. But like I said, in, in the plan for next year, what I'd like to do is try to put some wheat down. You know, normally if we get some corn harvested in the September or that corn, then it might have time. So then that way we could split the rows, maybe spread a little residue, and add some fertility down along with it. And I think too, I just saw a picture recently where they had, this was annual ryegrass, but even though the top growth was only a couple of inches, when they actually dug down, there was a lot more root mass underneath that, so sometimes I think it's deceiving what's actually in the soil. Okay, um, any more questions? I'll take one or two, one or two more, and then we'll let these guys go. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, ideally, yeah, that'd probably be the ideal situation, but our, our toolbar is not straight and true as, as much as it could be. And even though like we got auto steer, we can nudge things over. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to go in, clear a little residue, put your cover crop down, and then you know, save your AV line, go back in the same spot. Um, we don't have a properly tracking toolbar because we've always got like a 14 or 15 inch roll and a 25 on the other end. So, that is definitely something we want to do in the future, but we're not lined up for right now. So I did a couple fields that way and then found out that it wasn't staying consistent, so I just kind of went there and made it.